You are listening to the JJ Podcast, where discussions with people from all walks of life are being held. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the JJ Podcast. Today, I'm hosting Lucy Hess. Lucy is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She is a recent graduate from Kent State University with a bachelor's degree in theater performance. Uh, from the time she was six, she has been Irish dancing competitively and has traveled all over the world for competitions. Lucy began her journey in theater at the age of two and has been in over 70 product productions in her lifetime. Uh, it is certainly an honor to have Lucy here with me uh, in the virtual studio. Lucy, welcome. Thanks for having me. Hi. Yeah, so um, I'm interested to know about, uh, first off, about the uh, starting uh, theater at a very early age, uh, at the yeah. age of two. Uh, and, you know, you've been in more than 70 productions, which is amazing. It's fascinating. That's, that's a huge number. So uh, tell me about the early days. Uh, how did it start? Do you remember what the first ever theater perfor theater performance that you participated in? Yeah, it was at my church at home. My mom is um, a musician and a theater person, so she wanted my sister and I to try it when we were young. And our church did little musicals. And I can't remember what the, mm, the first one was called Nick at Night. It was like something about Nicodemus. I don't remember what it was, but I had one line. And I went up and I said that one line on stage. And then I sat on my mom's lap for the rest of the show in the front row. <laughs> um, and then the, a lot of the early theater was done through my church. Um, so that was like a good start to it because it was a pretty welcoming environment, pretty low stakes. But as I got older, um, I started, we started looking into like theater schools for me, theater programs to put me into so I could get a theater education um, and start like, I guess, training in theater. So I started training in theater when I was in third grade, second grade, in second grade. So I think it was like eight or nine years old when I actually started training theater. Mm, wow. So second, second grade, that would be like, uh, you were, you were very, you were very, very young at the time. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, yeah really back in the olden days. Wow. But yes. And, um, <laughs> And was it at that point that you realized that you wanted to uh, major in, in theater performance at Kent State University, or is it something that you yes. discovered uh, throughout the years after? Yeah? Yeah, wow. I mean, so my parents liked to put us into things that we were interested in. They, they were never parents that forced us to, like, try things, and if we hated it, they kept us in it. I knew from when I was young, I loved just... I love the attention. <laughs> and I also just really enjoyed um, singing. Singing was like my main thing, singing and dancing. I loved singing and dancing. And so by the time I was actually training in theater, when I was young, I knew it was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, wow. And studying theater in college is a difficult thing to break into because there's a big audition process for some schools and you want to make sure that you have training coming into that. Um, you don't have to, but it helps. So that's why I, I maintained training throughout from the time I was in second grade through when I basically graduated high school, I was training in theater. Um, so I, I definitely stuck with it because I knew I wanted to study theater in college. Wow. I like that. Uh, cause a lot of students, uh, uh you know, they reach, uh, you know, right before college, when they finish high school, sometimes they don't even know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, they enter the state of uh, yeah. uncertainty. And so only a few, I reckon, have this sort of uh, clear idea as to what they truly want to do in college. Uh, so I think uh, yeah, you're, I was, you're I one of the lucky ones who, who realized <laughs> it from the get-go. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, the the mindset that you put yourself in when you're about to perform and uh, when you're about to enter yeah. that sort of, um, let's say, uh, realm of letting go of oneself and letting the, you know, letting it all out. Uh, yeah. how, how does it, uh, how does it work for you? What, what sort of, let's say, routine that you put yourself in to, in, in order to make sure that your performance is like top notch? Yeah. 
my my process it starts um you know the morning of a performance i make sure that i get enough sleep that i feel my body correctly you know eat meals that i really enjoy ones that are going to keep me energized um and i like to keep my days because a lot of times performances are at night i keep my days pretty low-key um maybe do a little bit of exercise get those endorphins going and then when I get to the theater to get ready, I am a chronically early person. I like to be there very early so I can be familiar with the theater space I'm working in. Um, because having done so many mm -hmm. shows in so many different places, you know, I'm not used to one specific theater. I've, I've worked all over my city. Um, so, you know, I familiarize my space in the theater and make sure that wherever I'm getting ready is a comfortable space. So, like, sometimes I sit on the floor because that's what's comfortable to me. Um, I do whatever makeup I need to do and do my hair. I'm a very physical person, so I like to make sure that I feel very connected to my body, and that includes how I look. Um, so I make sure that my hair is perfect and that my makeup is perfect. And while I'm doing that, you know, I have my script and my, my music. I'm looking through it as I'm getting ready, not trying to stress myself out, but just making sure I'm familiar with the material. And by the time my hair is done, I like to start to get into the mindset of my character a little bit. So as I'm doing my hair, instead of thinking my own thoughts, I start thinking thoughts like, oh, what would my character think when they were doing their hair? You know, would they be singing a song in their oh, head? No. Um, I have, I create playlists for every character that I um, have played and I'll play those playlists mm. as I'm getting ready. It's music that I think they would listen to or music that reminds me of them. Um, and then I get my costume on and then I have like this weird little physical warm up that I do. Doesn't matter if the whole show is me sitting down. I really want to make sure that I'm physically warm and like not going to hurt myself because acting is very physical, even if you're not doing a whole lot. Um, and then I just go over with myself right before I get on stage. Every time you come on and off stage, you have a purpose. You know, you get on stage and you're coming from somewhere and you go off stage and you're going to somewhere. And even if it's not in the script, I like to know that. Um, so every time before I get on stage, I remind myself, I say, this is where I'm coming from. This is what I want. Here I go. And it's just, it's a constant understanding of the circumstances around your character. So pretty lengthy, but that's, wow. that's what I do. <laughs> no, I like that. Uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned a lot about the, uh, the, let's say, what is it? The, the mindset that you, that, you know, you, you find yourself that you put yourself in. And so yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that this is more of, let's say a solo performance, right? Because when it comes to uh, a performance where you, it's more like collaborative and you have other people forming as well, it's mm -hmm. a little bit different because you got to establish trust and you got to, you know, you got to know yeah. uh, there must be this sort of harmony between you and the other performers. Is Absolutely. that correct? Or, yeah. yeah that's How does that work for when it comes to a performance that's like more collaborative? So in a collaborative performance, I think every performance is collaborative, even if it's just yourself, because um, you have to work with different parts of yourself, yourself and the character, mm -hmm. they have to work together. But in like an ensemble environment, like you said, trust is so important. A lot of times that trust begins way before the um, the show even starts. I know, for example, a show I did my senior year at Kent State, we spent two weeks almost building ensemble and building this trust with our with our castmates and making sure that we're comfortable with physical boundaries and comfortable with you know the space that we share and so when you get into a performance it's really important that you know your stuff and you trust that your other actors know their stuff and at the end of the day acting is just reacting um and so you know, you really wow. want to make sure that you're as present as possible and that you're giving as much of your performance to everybody else and that you're just like open. Being open is huge mm -hmm. in acting. You have to make sure that you are ready and that even if you've done the show a hundred million times, that what your scene partner is saying to you, you take it as though it's the first time you ever heard it because it's the first time your character's ever heard it. Um, so, you know, understanding that spontaneity and understanding that fresh, that freshness that acting has to have for it to be authentic is really important to like trust your castmates, trust they know their stuff. 
um, and, and be comfortable with them, not only as like, oh, I'm acting with this person, but like, get to know them as people. That's huge. Like, I've done scenes with people that I haven't really talked to outside of doing the scenes. It has a really different feeling from being in a cast of people who do stuff outside of the theater together or have just sit down conversations like this. It builds trust. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I remember uh, watching uh, this this uh, one podcast the other day, uh, and uh, the person who was uh, the guest of the podcast was uh, a famous actor, uh, Robert Downey Jr. And um, oh. he, he mentioned, yeah, I'm sure you've heard of him before. Uh, he mentioned something uh, similar about, you know, establishing this sort of trust between you and your uh, and the other actors and those you're performing with. Um, but there are other times when you willingly choose to detach yourself from the other actors because that produces uh, like outside of the scenes you detach yourself yeah. from the other actors because that produces some uh, more of a, a genuine let's say display of the performance itself and what it truly entails because sometimes yes. you know the performance is about let's say two characters that are not really um that are supposed to be uh you know that have some sort of relationship that's a little bit too intense or you know that they're not so fond of one another uh has there ever been let's say a time or a performance when you had to do that specifically to detach yourself from the other actors in order to produce something so genuine yeah, absolutely. I did a um, a little piece with someone at Kent, and it was about um, two people who were meeting for coffee on a park bench after they had not been together for a while. And the one character's objective was to get me back, and my objective was to absolutely not take any of it, because I really had this disdain for this person. Um, and it was actually quite a challenge because the person I was doing the piece with was so wonderful and I loved talking to him and being around him. But um, what we would do is we would sit in our, it was virtual, um, which was actually kind of helpful to have the barrier of a screen between mm -hmm. one another. Um, but what we would do is we would get into our space to rehearse or into our little Zoom room to um, perform and we would just sit there in the Zoom space and just not look at the camera and, and be in each other's presence, <laughs> but not look at each other and not acknowledge and go up, like sit on our phone, go about our tasks for about five or 10 minutes before actually starting. And then he would leave the frame and he'd come into frame. And it was, you know, I'd finally engage and see him. And I was like, ew, what are you doing in my space? Cause you're so used to it just being you and we'd mute our mics. So it was just like, we were chilling. And so there was definitely a feeling of like an invasion of your personal little bubble. Um, and it, it made our scene really authentic. It's one of the pieces I'm most proud of that I worked on in, in school. Wow. Wow. And speaking of uh, the pieces that you're proud of, what, what are, let's say, the most memorable uh, pieces or performances that you think uh, will forever uh, remain firmly planted here? I think um, my senior year of college, I chose to do a one woman show. Um, and that is something that I will never forget. Like I am still astounded and very proud of myself for putting together that piece um, and, and making it what it was. And especially because that piece, it's called Fleabag. It's the original, um, it was, it's a show on Amazon Prime, um, but it was originally a one woman mm -hmm. theater piece. And that, the show on Amazon really spoke to me as a person. And when I read the actual theater piece, it spoke to me even more. So I think that is probably one of the most special performances ever. And then way, way back in the day when I was about nine years old, I did um a show at my high school um my mother was involved in the high school shows and music directing those and whenever they needed little kids i was always one of the little kids that they would bring in and we did the show called children of eden which is a very special really beautiful show and i just played a bunny rabbit um but there was something about that show about the cast about how beautiful um 
we had all of these amazing handmade puppets that were made out of natural materials. Um, and just the most incredible set with like two turntables and stuff like came out of the floor. And, and just the way that that cast worked together and the team worked together and the way that they embraced me as a young person into like engaging with the high schoolers. Like high schoolers don't want anything to do with a nine year old normally, but the way that they <laughs> right. engaged with me and, and the beautiful thing that we created as a whole, I think will always speak to me. I like can't listen to the original cast album anymore because I mm -hmm. like our version like better. <laughs> sort of thing and you know that's actually not the case it was high school but you know there's something really special about that show to me i will always have a strong emotional connection to that show as well wow and uh here's here's something i'm interested to know of um when you when you're about to perform and you know when they're calling out you know action or i don't know what the word is what do they use when you're like when you're about to start is it action yeah. also when it comes to theater okay uh yeah it's places do you still... yeah, whatever. uh-huh yeah is it uh like you've you've performed so many uh, uh so many uh, uh performances and you've participated uh in over 70 and i'm wondering if you know if you no longer feel that sort of nervousness or if it's still uh, if it's still part of the process, like you can never, uh, y y like it, it's always there. You can never sort of destroy it. Um, so what do you think about that? Yeah, it's, it's always there. Um, as much as I'd like to say, oh, I don't get nervous. I absolutely do. And I think that that's <laughs> really important. I think that people that say they're not nervous before they perform are either lying or aren't like really feeling it. I mean, that's just me. But like, mm -hmm. I think the nerves are so important because like I said, being present and treating every moment like it's the first time it's happened is what makes acting so authentic. And I think that if you treat every performance with those nerves and with that excitement, like it's your first time you've ever been on stage, I think that really enhances the performance. And also nerves sometimes help you make choices that you normally wouldn't make if you were just on autopilot. Um, nerves put, it, like, put you into a heightened sense of awareness a little bit, and that's really important for mm -hmm. acting. And sometimes when you're the most nervous, you can create the most spontaneous and unexpected moments for your character and for the for the show as a whole. Wow. And uh, with, with, when, it, when it comes to these performances that you participate in, uh, do you have a partic particular preference or is it anything that would allow you to practice your art? Uh, do you like have like only very specific performances that I want to participate in? Like, what do you prioritize? Uh, is it the cast, uh, the, the story itself, the message that is being conveyed or what, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, I think it's changed for me over the years. When I was a kid, I wanted any chance to be on stage that I could get my little hands on. I just, I wanted to be on stage. I wanted to wear a costume and be somebody else and sing and dance and act. But now as, as an adult, I really do prioritize the story that's being told and the, the intentions behind it. Because I think mm -hmm. the, the world of theater today is very confusing and sometimes a little bit disappointing, especially with Broadway. There's a lot of stories that have, been told on Broadway for over 20 years that are the same story still being told and there's plenty of new musicals and plenty of new plays out there written by like people of color and like just really diverse groups that aren't getting the the, the space that they deserve and so I think it's for me I really gravitate towards pieces that are telling stories that need to be told that deserve to be told and it's it's fun to do classic musicals and it's fun to do all these things. But nowadays, if I'm going to do a, a classic show or a show that's been done a lot of times, I want to make sure that it's being done in a different way. Like I want, you know, I don't want to do the same production of the music band that I've done three times already. I want something different. I want a diverse cast. I want a director who is looking to change things and make something new out of something old. 
So definitely has changed over the years, but I think it's really important as a theater artist to seek out projects that make you feel good, make you feel happy, but also are intended to um, bring the public something fresh. Mm. Oh, okay. So uh, here's uh, something that I just, you know, uh, I just thought about it actually when you mentioned uh, the the part of innovation when you know you want to produce something new from something old. Um, yeah. So is this something you're? Uh, is this something like a like like a remake? Is that what you're referring to? Like re a, a like a remake or just yeah. taking inspiration from an old piece? Uh, uh, kind of creating something new out of it and revolutionizing it like what's uh what's what's the angle is it a remake or you know something entirely new from something old yeah so there's there's both um the thing i was mm -hmm. mainly referring to was a revival which is essentially a remake but um with a revival you you take an original show that opened you know back in the 50s or the 60s and you take it and you you take the same script for the most part you go back through that script, you go through it with a fine tooth comb and make it relevant to, I mean, it depends on the revival. Some revivals will just slap the same old show back on a new stage with bigger tech, bigger sets, different cast. But the revivals that are really innovative mm -hmm. are the revivals that make sure that the show is staying relevant in today's like social and political culture and also being really aware of casting and how like potentially casting a person of color in a role, how that changes the story and how that enhances it maybe. Um, so there's revivals, but then there also are shows that take tropes from old shows and that pay homage to all of these like old shows and create something completely brand new out of it. And those are some shows that are really cool and special um, that, that really deserve um, a space because they're, they're poking fun at old stuff, but they're also really respecting old things and making them into something new. Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, and what about, uh, I think, I think now is the time to, you know, to, to bring into the discussion Irish dance, because we didn't really highlight yeah. that much in the uh, in yeah. our conversation so far. Uh, so uh, that is something you started at the age of six, or was yes. it nine or six? Yeah. Six. Um, and were you um, the one who established the club at Kent State University, or was it uh, you and Abby? So actually, it was a girl who graduated before us. Her name was Rachel Pittman. Um, she mm -hmm. started the club her freshman or sophomore year of college. She graduated in, I want to say 2019. Yeah, the end of my freshman year, she graduated. Um, mm -hmm. And she was awesome. She is like from the greater Ohio area. She danced at a school that I was familiar with. Um, and she started it and it was very, very small, still is very small. Um, but then when she left, she left it to me and Abby. Interesting. And uh, uh, I remember the time, uh, the the homecoming uh, parade, it was uh, 2021, yeah. last fall. Uh, mm -hmm. That was, uh, that was for me like a, like a huge experience. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm like a, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a star, like I just started dancing. I didn't really know much about yeah. Irish dance. I'm still like a rookie at the time. And I remember in the uh, in the performance when you know when we were performing uh, live in front of like the local um, uh, live in front of the locals. Um, I remember just one time when um, when you were uh, you were at the front and I was I was way in the back, and you were saying, um, uh, "Dancers, are you ready?" And I was like, oh my God, we're just about to start. <laughs> because like the beginning was like, we were all trying to walk to our yeah. designated spot. You know, remember we were in the parking lot and then yes. we go all the way down the street. And then that's when we start performing. And I was like, oh my God, this is the moment, you know, you can either make it or break it. And so I was like entirely nervous. I, w I don't think I've ever been this nervous before in my life. It's like the first <laughs> time I ever try it. <laughs> yeah. And it was just hilarious, but I truly enjoyed it. And um, I, I had 
yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm at the beginning, I was like, I'm not going to perform live. Uh, but then I was like, just, you know, let's do it and see how it yeah. goes. And so it was, it was such a great experience. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the status of the club is right now. Have you been keeping up? I mean, you've definitely yeah. put so much effort and energy to it. Um, so yeah, what's, uh, how's it looking so far? It's good. Having Actually, left it funny behind. Mission Homecoming Parade. They they danced in Homecoming Parade this morning. So funny you bring that up. Um, oh, I think wow. there were, I want to say, four or five people who danced, and then I think we had a couple people who walked alongside with us, like like um, last year, same thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I saw that like we had like a speaker and a wagon, little sign. Um, so yeah, it's wow. every. They looked like they were having a lot of fun. They danced so. I'm really happy to see that it is um, still alive and well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, I uh, I would have to check out the the pictures if uh, you know yeah. if they updated the, the status. Yeah, they're on the you know, Instagram. Uh, it's certainly been like almost like a year now. Yeah. 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 That's so cool. Wow. So. Um, from your performances in in Irish dance, uh, what can you? What, what's the most memorable? Was it at Kent State or outside mm -hmm. of Kent State? What's uh? What can you tell me about that? Definitely outside of Kent State because I was a very competitive Irish dancer, um, and I was in like the very like I was in the elite level spheres of Irish dance. So there's a lot of high pressure performance. Um, I think the most memorable Irish dance performance I ever had was my very first national competition um and it's north american nationals so it's us canada and mexico all competing in one and the national competition is wow. the best irish dancers in that whole sphere um nationals is very difficult to get to and you know six-year-old me never thought that she would get to nationals and so my very first nationals was really special it was in new orleans louisiana um and for a long time when I was younger, I used to smile when I danced and when I competed because, you know, that was the thing to do. But then as I got older and a little bit more competitive, um, I was really focused and really trying to like, because I'm, I'm very short, I'm five foot two in Irish dance. A lot of it is fighting for attention on stage because you're dancing with one other person at, at all times. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times people I dance with are like, way way taller than me so i would like have this very serious game face on and like up until that year at nationals i had kept that game face and i walked on stage and i i got in my spot i was like so nervous i was like ready to pee my pants i was so scared and then the music started and i had my game face on and i started dancing and all of a sudden this smile just broke out on my face and i couldn't get rid of it because i was just so proud of myself and wow. so happy and the photos they take like mid dance photos at the major competitions at regionals nationals worlds they take photos and normally i never buy them but i purchased a couple of them because just the smile on my face is so real and like even talking about it i just it brings me so much joy to remember that and my friends were standing at the very very back of this giant performance hall i was dancing in and they were like pumping their fists and just like <laughs> so excited for me it was such a wonderful environment I, I didn't do great it was my first nationals but i will never forget that i was just so so proud of myself and so happy wow i like that that's yeah. that's amazing so you were you were very, very young at the time. I, that was, uh, you said you were, how old were you at the time? My first nationals was 16, so not too young. Oh, 16. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. And afterwards, you participated in, uh, did you manage to make it again to nationals or? I did, yes. Or not? Oh. Yeah. Wow. And what was your last uh, national? Uh, when was it? My final nationals was actually my final competition. I retired at my last nationals, mm -hmm. which was 2019 in Vancouver, um, Vancouver, Canada. And wow. it was, you know, it was definitely bittersweet um, because, you know, it was my last competition, but um, I was really pleased with with how I um, 
placed. I wasn't necessarily pleased with how I performed. I had a couple like weird things happen on stage. I mean, you know, it happens. You can't really control that. Um, yeah. But the end result was something that I was very proud of. Um, so it was weird. Like a lot of times I'm way more proud of my dancing than I was of how I placed. But at this nationals, I was way more proud of how I placed than how I danced. So that's just how it worked <laughs> out. Irish dance judging is like so subjective and so weird. So, you know, anytime I play, so I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> wow. Interesting. So, uh, what are, um, we, we, we talked about, uh, you know, the successes, let's say, of participating in so many, uh, performances and starting at a very early age. Um, but, you know, I think there is an aspect to, uh, live performance where, you know, you must not make like a mistake or a huge mistake that's noticeable, right? Yeah. Like you got to be at the top of your level. Um, so I'm interested in knowing about like, uh, uh, if there has if there have been any sort of performance at one point where you know uh you made a mistake and learned so much from it uh and you incorporated those lessons that you learned in another performance so what can you tell me about like a, a memorable moment when you you thought you were like ugh i messed up you know <laughs> i mean not necessarily well so in irish dance i have an irish dance one and a theater one do you want both uh, you can share both of them. I think that Perfect. would be worthwhile. Yeah. So yeah. my Irish dance one, I, all the time in competition, girls fall. We're like kicking our legs to our faces and jumping around and we're nervous and the floors are slick and you know, you don't quite, you can't know the condition of the floor until you're on it. I was so proud of myself. I had never fallen in competition. I was 17 years old. I'd never fallen once. That's big. Wow. Like Bravo. 10 years of competition, never fallen. And I was on stage and I was just kind of like not focused. I got there at a weird time. I wasn't ready. I volunteered to go first, stupid. Get on stage and I'm just like, I'm not warm. I'm like weird. I was just in a weird headspace and I was up at the front and I did a kick and I kicked too hard. And when I came back down from the kick, my feet didn't hit the floor and I just fell flat on my face in front of the judges. Whoa. Oh my and goodness. I got right back up that must have hurt. Have a belt. Oh, it did. <laughs> <laughs> they have a bell that they ring to stop. And they were like, oh my gosh, are you okay? I was just laughing because I'd never fallen before. Oh and you know, goodness. you have to learn some girls fall and they like burst into tears, even if they're not hurt. And like, I get it. it you know, it's upsetting. But I just laughed it off. And then the whole room laughed and it was fine. <laughs> you know, so taking your mistakes yeah. with grace i think is something that's important especially in irish dance where you have to be this polished perfect elite dancer if you fall you know it's funny it's okay get back up do it again um but right. then theater i was playing annie in annie i was probably 12. um and if you've ever seen annie you know annie wears this red dress at the end of the film or at the end of the musical it's this very iconic look and mm -hmm. um for some reason my my brain and my backstage dresser's brain were not on the same page and she thought we were somewhere different in the show and no. me being 12 i was like oh i trust the adult so she puts me in um it was a very quick costume change i go backstage she's putting me in the dress i'm not really paying attention because i'm trying to remember my lines and get my props ready i get out on stage and as i'm on stage i realize that i'm supposed to be wearing the red dress and i'm very much not in the red dress and i was like oh crap and the thing about Annie is like, that's the iconic thing. So everybody's waiting for it. We have like 15 minutes left of the whole musical and I'm not in the red dress. I'm oh. like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I'm 12 years old. I'm like, huh. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> I knew that later, like five minutes till the end of the show, um, Annie is reunited with her dog, Sandy. Um, they bring Sandy out as like a Christmas present for her. And they bring all the orphans on stage and bring them to the mansion and give them Christmas presents about 10 minutes till the end of the show. And I had a line that was like, look, girls, there's presents here for all of us. And so I was on stage and I was like, how do I get the red dress on? And I realized I said, oh, my gosh, instead of just saying that line, I'm going to get off stage, get my dress changed and then get Sandy as like the final present. So instead of her coming out five minutes into the show, I'm going to bring her out 10 minutes 
to cover up the fact oh. that I just had to run off stage and change my dress. Um, <laughs> and it worked and it was fine oh. and, and nothing bad came. I mean, everybody on stage was like a little bit like, <laughs> why is there a dog right now? The dog's not supposed to be here. <laughs> but, you know, we all had that trust in each other. They had that trust in me and the, the trust in understanding and knowing the show. And everybody just automatically was like, yes, there's a dog. Great. Awesome. Let's continue. Um, so I think that really, you know, making wow. that mistake and, you know, there's an element of thinking on your feet during during theater because there's this thing that we call the 80-20 rule. Um, it's 80% your character and 20% you at all times. That 20% is reserved for personal safety. If you're on stage and you're in character and you see something that's like hanging from the ceiling, that 20% of your brain says, hey, move. Or that 20% of my brain said, hey, I need to change my dress, so I need to get off stage. You know, so it's it's making sure that you're very aware of things at all times. So when you make a mistake, you can cover it up as seamlessly as possible. Wow. You mentioned this idea of um uh what is it called improvisation like is that is that yes, the improv. uh is is yeah yeah improv yeah you, like theater has like a, a particular term to it right improv yeah. uh how often did you have to do that aside from this particular story where you were so quick on your feet uh did this ever like how often does that happen in performances where you really have to be quick you know you see something that's a little bit too fishy or you know you there's something going on that's wrong and you have to do something you know a reaction you know you said acting is reacting so i want to bring that back to you so yeah yeah the the beauty of live theater is that it is live humans make mistakes all the time and people come see live theater to catch a glimpse of humans messing up sometimes, you know? And so genuinely countless instances in my life of all of my performances where me or a fellow actor has made a mistake and then somebody else is super quick and is really like engaged in thinking and they will just like put in like a quick little zinger line that's hilarious that addresses the mistake, but <laughs> makes it part of the show and addresses it in character um and so that's that's why when you train in theater you train in improv sometimes first i know when i was a child my acting training was not the acting training i got in college it was all improv based training because that is the basis of acting improv is just spontaneous things and reacting and, and saying yes and continuing on there's like this concept of yes and when you improv it's like oh this mm -hmm. thing oh yeah and this you you're continuing to build on the circumstances that you've created around yourself so improv is a huge um skill to have and a very important skill to have when you're doing live theater because live theater is live and full of life and full of mistakes interesting wow uh, so, uh, here's something I really want to, uh, ho I really want to bring to discussion that is, uh, traveling abroad because I've, I've traveled to a couple of countries before, but you, you've traveled, uh, I'm sure many, many countries. Like, uh, I, like, uh, for me, like, you know, I could count the countries that I've traveled to, um, oh, same. <laughs> but for you, I think you've. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. it's not that far off. Yeah. No, not. Well, what, I mean, what's. I'm, um, I'm lucky I've traveled to a lot, but I still want to get more places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, performances. So, when you get to travel, you uh, do you get a chance to uh, explore the places that you go to? Or is it that, you know, you're traveling for the purpose of the performance and it's like an in and out type of mission? You know, uh, what what's it like for you? So, it depends. For Irish dance, um, I am a little bit different from a lot of other people who compete. A lot of people like to be at the venue really early and like to, like I said, I'm chronically early, but for Irish dance, I like to get in, get out. Cause I'm, <laughs> I go into like this laser focus mode when I compete in Irish dance. And so if we're in a place for like too long, I kind of lose focus. So what I like to do is I like to get to where I'm competing, 
whatever it may be, a different country, a different state, a different city, I like to get there like the night before or the day before, compete, and then afterwards I like to explore. Um, because once the stress is off, you compete for one day and then you're done. So you have this whole mm -hmm. time to make memories in this new place. So my family, a lot of times, um, our regional competition in my region in the U.S. was took place over Thanksgiving weekend. So in late November. Um, and my family always liked to turn that into a little bit of like a winter vacation. So we went to <laughs> Chicago for one year for our competition and you know we got there day before I competed I competed and then we spent like three days just exploring the city and going to see like different landmarks and just enjoying um being in the place and my family is not a family who is a sightseeing kind of family especially when we visit different countries we like to be in those countries for like two weeks or more and we just instead of staying at a hotel we get a house and that's like close to a city center or in a little town and we just live there and we grocery shop and we do as the people who live there do. And of course, you know, you wow. go see the famous stuff, but we just like to enjoy life in different places to experience different cultures as best we can. Mm, I like that. And yeah. right now, uh, for you being in Florida and, uh, yeah starting this sort of uh, new life, let's say. Uh, did you get a chance to explore? Uh, did you get a chance to uh, it, be a local or impersonate a local as you guys would do, you and your family? Um, what, can you tell me, what can you tell me about the uh, this new journey that you, uh, you're uh, taking part of? So I'm currently working for the Walt Disney Company. I'm working at Walt Disney World in the parks. Um, and I grew up going to Walt Disney World multiple times a year with my family so honestly even though i'm coming to a new state and my parents are all the way on the other side of the country i feel very much at home here um because i'm familiar with the orlando area and i'm familiar with where i'm working every day um but i feel really lucky because you know those trips you're trying to go to the parks and you're trying to do this and do that and so it's really nice to just experience the area without having an agenda um so I like mm. to take a walk. I'm walking distance from my downtown area. So I like to take a walk once or twice a week. And we have a farmer's market every weekend. So I explore that. I talk to the different vendors that are there, introduce myself. Hey, I'm new to the area. Nice to meet you. Um, I like to go to different, like, you know, I, sometimes I just take a drive down the road and see what's there. Um, and so it's really interesting. Um, also, the the pace of life in Florida is so different from the pace of life in Pittsburgh. Um, up north, oh, how so? Life, <laughs> oh, it's so fast and it's so like, go, go, go all the time. But like Florida time, it's weird. Like it takes forever to get everywhere because the stoplights take forever. <laughs> um, <the stoplights laughs> really? take three minutes a piece. If you get stuck at a red light, you're just like, oh, I might as well put my car in park. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of like hustle and bustle around here but there's not much to do about it. There's not much like urgency down here. It's like, everybody's going where they're going. There's a lot of people. It's a big area, but we're just going. But in Pittsburgh, it's like, go all the time. Ah, so it's interesting <laughs> because I still am very much have that, that ah about me. And I just sometimes have to be like, Hey, yeah, just relax. Like you live somewhere else. It's cool. Just chill. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Mindset. No, I'm, I'm sure you've adjusted by now. I mean, it's been uh, what four months, as we mentioned yeah. earlier, or before we yeah, started recording. Yeah, just about four months. Wow, that's so awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, was it like your 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 uh, your current work right now with Walt Disney? Was it as you expected it to to be, or was there something, uh, let's say, novel about uh, the, the experience uh, uh, since you've started? So it was definitely, it met all of my expectations for sure, um, which I think is rare for people that come in to work for Disney. I've wanted to work for Disney since I was young. Since I started coming as a child, I knew that I wanted to be a part of, of what this is. Um, but I will say that, you know, working for a large corporation absolutely has um, ups and downs, but I familiarized myself with those ups and downs from a very young age. So I wasn't taken aback by anything. I wasn't horrified by anything. I was actually surprised 
at how easy it is to make people happy. You know, I wanted to work mm. at Walt Disney World because there were cast members when I was a child that made really special memories for me. And I wanted to be that person for other people. And what I didn't realize is just how little things that you do can make somebody's day. And also the idea that you can create like a core memory for someone and you'll never know. You know, because wow. it's so fleeting your interactions with guests. I see within an hour, if I'm in a certain position at the Haunted Mansion, I see almost 2,000 guests in an hour. And it's just, you see them and they go. Um, and, you know, I do my best to my uphold goodness. the show that I have to uphold and, and to make people happy in the way that I can. But, you know, 2,000 people in an hour, it's seconds that you see every guest. And so, you know... I'm sure that there are guests that I'm a part of their vacation memories that I don't even know about it. And that's very heartwarming. And like, I've had guests come up to me and, you know, I smile at them or I engage with their child in a princess dress. I curtsy to the princess and I have parents that will come and, and give me little like tokens of their appreciation. Like on my nightstand, actually, I have that's this little so bottle. Kind. I have this little bottle of glitter that was given to me from oh, a guest wow, thanking me for the pixie dust with like a nice little note. Um, I have a lot of like just little mementos from guests with whom I had short interactions, but that short interaction meant a lot to them. And that was very surprising to me because as a guest, you know, these things feel so grandiose to you because it feels like it's just for you. But when you're making magic for 2000 guests an hour, I guess it's not you know, that grandiose to you as the person making the magic, but the person who it's for, that's huge. That was really surprising and very that's, special. That's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's funny how things have, uh, you know, it's funny that you're now in a position, uh, like back then you were just a guest and now, you know, you're spreading that love and joy to the children. Yeah. It's like back then you were a child and now exactly. uh, you're, yeah, that's just so beautiful. That's so nice. Thanks. Yeah, it's. I think it's one of those... Uh, one of those very unique, uh, let's say, aspects of being, uh, of occupying such a position and uh, doing this, this yeah. job. It's like it keeps you going, you know, knowing that you're going to yes, bring joy and absolutely. happiness to children. 100%. Yeah, I like that. Wow. Uh, I couldn't help but notice the, uh, the art uh piece you have in the in the back uh <laughs> yeah. that's uh yeah even though it's a little bit too pixelated because i met as i mentioned like during the recording uh things get a little bit too yeah. pixelated uh, but i'm sure like my audience would definitely uh see it once uh you know once the, you know during yeah. the post-production when, when uh, things clear out so um lucy we're close to wrapping things up and i want to i want to ask you this one uh final thing uh final question do you ever think or do you imagine that at some point you would be transitioning from theater and performing and let's say movies because i know that a lot of actors you know so some of them transition from theater and go into like major productions like you know like hollywood or something like yeah. that so yeah have you ever thought about that before <laughs> I have. I've very much considered film. I took a film acting class back at Kent, um, and I wasn't sure how I would like it because film acting and theater acting are two wildly different things. A camera can tell mm -hmm. when you're lying. A camera can tell if you're not in it. A camera is so personal and can see every minute thing on your face. And in theater, you're, you're encouraged to make things big so the back row can see it. Um, so, you know, it was a big adjustment for me, but I did find a lot of success in that class. Um, and a lot of my classmates were like, you should seriously consider film. Um, but you know, I think it's all in good time. Um, I, like I said, with theater, I want to tell stories that are important and that deserve and need to be told. And so I think if the right project came along and I felt compelled to audition for it, then I absolutely would. Um, I'm not looking to do it right now, but like a couple years down the line, if there's a film project that I get cast in, sure, absolutely. You know, I think it's really important to put out feelers every so often, you know, chuck an audition here and there and see what comes of it. You know, like Irish dance, mm. theater and acting is really subjective. And so it just is a matter of who's in that audition room, who's watching your tape and, 
you know, do you have the right look? Do you have the right sound? Um, so yeah, I would love to, but you never know. <laughs> wow. Nice. Uh, I hope that, uh, you know, uh, even in the future, uh, you'd land something as beautiful and as memorable as, you know, uh, or maybe keep doing what you're doing right now. You know, that's, yeah. uh, it seems to be bringing you a lot of joy and even, it uh, it seems to be bringing the children joy and the guests. Um, yeah. well, uh, Lucy, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed our conversation together. Oh my gosh. Likewise. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. Absolutely. And I hope uh, maybe someday we'd uh, record uh, another episode together. Absolutely. 100%. I hope you enjoyed this episode from the JJ Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date with all the content.